Welcome back to the channel. No real prelude, so let's hop on in. The Warrior Sons were just the last eight models, so I could put these boys in the dun pile. I probably agonized over those capes more than I should have. It was all about fitting them onto my batch painting system. Painting rainbow stripes, going over them with gradient colors, and trying to blend it all together was a bit of a hassle, but I liked the way it looked overall. This was the first time I used the Grey Knight's blue shade over silver technique to get the metal very iridescent and colorful. I think it came out pretty well, though I need to work on getting smoother lines with metallic paint in general. It's difficult due to the particulate nature of the paint. Every once in a while it feels like it's genuinely gritty or thicker than standard. I remember experimenting with blending the rainbow colors of the cape with shade paints, but I don't like how much it deadened the colors. I think I went over a few with highlights, but the basic use of tones was probably the best way to represent it. I do like the dichotomy of their silver armor with the black lining behind it and the brightly colorful cape on the other side. It's a fun offset between business up front and party in the back. I've never played with these guys on the tabletop, but they seem to have excellent staying power with high morale and a chance to boost their offensive or defensive capabilities by surviving morality checks or getting through panic tests. A very flexible and sturdy unit that should be very useful on the battlefield. Mira Reed's net was a challenge to approach, trying to figure out how to paint it properly. I'm still not 100% on it, but it's a difficult thing to represent in plastic. Just thread and bundles and shade. I did enjoy painting her greenish browns tinged scale mail, kind of a swampy ruster tint to something that was otherwise a very golden color. I wonder now if I could have added a few Typhus Corrosion highlights, but that might have added too much of a different tone. Starks are always a blur of earth tones, grays, and beiges. Slightly boring, but practical. Kind of like the Starks themselves. A unit like Mira Reed is really just picking out where to put the greens and where to put the browns. On the subject of mishmashing browns and greens, behold Jojen Reed. His shaggy mop of hair killed the need to add eyebrows, but uh, I think I managed to get a decent expression. The sunken nature of his eyes made me break my rule about painting eyes in one pass to avoid overcomplicating or gooping up the model. I kind of went in to try to fix one that looked a little blotchy. I have no idea what his big sack is supposed to be. It's either full of fish or reed secrets. I did like that tiny little bowl with the spiral ends. A recurve, I want to call it. Stringing it was a chore, but I do like doing that. Borden from Cthulhu Death May Die was a deceptive model, with a lot more detail and mixing than first glance would imply. She was the first model I painted with very visible glasses, and that meant fiddling around with colors. Eventually I decided on a glossy blue-white with a little bit of lacquer finish, rather than trying to actually depict her eyes on her lenses, Velma Dinkley style. Of greater concern was her dress. I could have kept it a flat red, but the art had a floral pattern, and I like the challenge. I painted the pattern on in vertical lines, trying to follow the flow of the skirt and the motion of her swing. It more or less worked, although there are still a few areas that got a little muddled. It was good practice for this kind of freehanding, and I'm happy with it. Rasputin from Call of Cthulhu was as simple as can be, just grays, blacks, and skin tones. My only real areas of concern were his eyes and that fire that he's holding in his palms, which I'm happy with for now. This was my first real attempt at painting a noticeable fireball, and I was surprised at the difference a simple white base coat could make. It really looks like it's glowing or emitting soft light. Zombies. Not much to say about these rotters, aside from that these two mark the halfway point of all the zombies in the base game. Holding up the first fat zombie I painted to this one really shows some development in my technique especially considering that they have a very similar color scheme. The runner is a reminder that I don't paint a lot of dark-skinned models, and I can always put in more practice. As always, the hardest thing on these two are those beady little white eyes. Now we get to Pedro Cantor, the biggest accomplishment of the month. I've been working on this guy for the better part of a year, gradually collecting parts, agonizing, and planning out how to make up the model itself, I approached the kit bash gradually, finding and assembling pieces from the limited amount of Primaris chunks available at the time. The biggest holdout was the ammo belt for his Storm Bolter. The Storm Bolter itself was sort of hacked together from a pair of pistols. But I finally managed to snag a nice belt from a generous Christmas gift. I won't go through the full breakdown, but 
This Pedro contains pieces from Primaris Captains, Imperial Fist upgrades, Ultramarine upgrades, Aggressors, Cannibalized Intercessors, Skull Sets, and plenty of Shale chips around the base to give him something to stand on. As a Chapter Master, Pedro was built to be a centerpiece for his army. That meant sticking him up on a platform decorated in orc skulls and giving him a nice wide open pose. I've always enjoyed the Crimson Fists as a very utilitarian faction, so that meant minimal bells and whistles on their Chapter Master. Pedro's a humble guy, for a space marine at least, and I wanted that conservative attitude to be reflected in his getup. I made a point of giving him the standard black circle on his heraldry, as opposed to the white one that my Primaris have. If I had to come up with an actual reason for the change in heraldry, I'd say that fresh Primaris forces consider themselves unworthy of wearing the black circle after understanding the sheer hell an average Crimson Fist uh, veteran has endured, and have elected to wear the Astartes equivalent of a white belt until they feel they've earned the Black Circle through endurance and sacrifice. That was just off the top of my head and sounds suitably melodramatic. I only chose the White Circle in the first place to spice up their color scheme. The standard Crimson Fist look is a bit drab. That's also why I usually add silver trim to their pauldrons. Going back to Pedro and looking at his original model, there's definitely a dip in features, but I consciously wanted to clean him up a bit. Also, he's right-handed now because that's the only power fist that I could get, and I also definitely prefer that eagle over the huge banner with his name on it the original mini has. I don't understand the purpose for that thing. I guess it's useful if someone forgets his name in the middle of a firefight. If there's one thing I do want to do over, it would be the heraldry on the shield itself. The decals I stuck on feel very last minute and sparse compared to the rest. Maybe I could paint a nice little coat of arms up there. I think that a lot of what I like about the Crimson Fists is encapsulated by their chapter master, Pedro Cantor. Resilient, self-critical, adaptive, and compassionate. I wanted to do him justice, and since I only collect Primaris, I wanted to give him that little Rubicon update that everyone seems to be so fond of nowadays. This was a relatively sparse month production-wise, but I did see a return in distribution for a fair few mini-makers, and some sets that I've ordered ages ago have started to come in. Chief among them are the Baratheon Heroes 1 and 2 that have finally arrived, giving me plenty of options for these two feuding brothers and their potential loadouts. My pending list was almost withering from a lack of attention. And that's everything this month. I was surprisingly busy for the bulk of June, so my input definitely stuttered, but I'm hoping that these resumed inflow of new minis will keep me motivated. At this point, my 40k backlog has actually been whittled down to just a few stragglers. Though, with Indominus on the way and all those Necrons, it may just fill right back up again. Running tallies, I painted 15 miniatures in the month of June, bringing my numbers up to 127, with the Baratheons and a last-minute board game shipment putting me at 145 models pending. The gap grows wider. I was so close to crossing it. Having reached the middle of the year, I'm pleased with my progress for the most part. See you at the end of July.